Hi everyone. Before we begin, we would just like to give a shout out to the sponsor of this episode, Best Fiends. Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Jess, and this is Skinwalker. Ice cream vans were as well established a feature in Glasgow as they were in any other major city in Britain. They park on the pavement, play a catchy jingle to alert hungry potential locals to their arrival, then serve frozen treats to their customers. When vast new housing developments sprung up on isolated edge of city areas in the 1950s, the ice cream vans sensibly followed. Their trade improved from their previous routes as the developers of the new estates missed out one key area in their urban planning, amenities. They built rows and rows of houses, many stacked high on top of one another, but did not build units for local shops to occupy. People had no place to buy food easily and quickly. Procuring goods required a planned trip either walking or by bus to somewhere which had these stores. Ice cream vans began to expand on their offering, making a trade of goods such as tobacco, general foodstuffs, milk and bread. One firm, Marchetti's, found a particularly lucrative way of doing things by opening up a cash and carry, a type of large wholesale store to sell goods to their franchisees. Their franchisees would then take their Marchetti leased van out into the new housing schemes. They were making money twice, with high profit margins on their wholesale goods, then taking money off the franchisee to use their van on a Marchetti ice cream route. The Marchettis also owned the best routes due to the firm manner and how they did business. They identified profitable ice cream van routes, which were serviced by independent owners, then strong-armed their van in, willing to eat some cost to either starve out the competition or force them to join up as a Marchetti affiliate. There were allegations of misconduct in smashing van windows, intimidating drivers and threats being issued to coerce drivers to join their ranks. Whatever their method, it worked and by the mid-1970s there were around 30 Marchetti runs for eagle-eyed franchisees to pay to work. The profit in the run was not always as promised, given the Marchettis were known to inflate the price of goods within their cash and carry. The gains did however become more lucrative for some once they started reselling stolen car stereos from their vans. In the late 1970s, alcohol abuse was joined by drug abuse on the estates. Some of the bigger players in organised crime allegedly saw further potential in the fleet of ice cream vans which patrolled Glasgow's schemes. Some of the vans allegedly began peddling heroin and other drugs on the side. Many of the faces involved and the ice cream van men who fronted the operating window themselves, have since cast doubt on this. It seems unlikely, given the attention which the ice cream vans received, that they would have been selling drugs curbside. As many of the faces involved have since stated, there was enough money in selling cigarettes and dry goods given the lack of shopping opportunities within the estates. They didn't need the extra heat. One particularly high up face in Glasgow's underworld, called Tam the Licensee McGraw, was quick to see the opportunity to diversify his business. His wife Margaret ran an ice cream van on a route which made a decent trade, 
but that was with Margaret treating it as a social opportunity. She spent more of her shift chatting with customers and friends than peddling the wares on the shelves and the counter. McGraw was far more scrupulous in making money. His primary legal cash flow was from his pub, hence his nickname. But he was always happy to make some money, and while never proven, McGraw and an associate allegedly silently took over one of the two big van firms at 50 Ices on Blair Turnock Road in Queensley. 50s, as it was more commonly known, was a cash and carry with ice cream van docking spaces to remain overnight. Whether he was the outright benefactor of 50s or not, he was a regular face in the place and ran at least several vans serviced by the yard. Tam McGraw soon involved a man named Teddy Rennock in a new ice cream van route through 50 Ices for his soon-to-be freed friend, Thomas T.C. Campbell. Campbell was at the time serving eight years for attempted murder and riotous assembly. Rennock was the legitimate face of the operation as he had a trader's permit and a history of running legitimate ice cream vans in the East End. Rennock was brought to a meeting at McGraw's house on a Sunday afternoon before Campbell's release. When he arrived, Tam McGraw sat him down and explained what was to happen. Rennock and Campbell were to muscle in on a Marchetti van route in Carntine. The run, McGraw explained, currently took in £300 a night by his estimate and Campbell would advise the current owner of the run it was time to take early retirement. Rennock was told he would be entirely free of the burden of dealing with the pending turf war. That would be for the heavy of the party to sort with the Marchettis and their lads. All he had to do was pay McGraw and Campbell on time and ensure the van looked above board while he behaved above board. Three weeks later, after TC had spoken with the driver of the Marchetti van, a man named David, Rennock took to the streets of Carntine. He stopped at all the critical points of sale that same Marchetti driver had designated as profitable on his ten years serving the route. McGraw was right. The first day's takings were nearly £300, and that was without the sale of anything harder than nicotine. The violence began on the second day, with the Marchetti van and the new van fronted by Teddy competing for Carntine's foot trade. According to Rennock, halfway through the run on Myerside Street, Thomas Campbell queued for the competing Marchetti van. When he arrived at the serving window, it was not to order ice cream. Instead, Campbell pulled out a hammer and smashed the rear serving window. The van driver quickly hopped in the driver's seat and took off as fast as the low-powered ice cream van would allow. On the Friday of the first week, as Teddy Rennock finished the last stop on his ice cream van's route, which was Inverleaf Street, he saw a Marchetti van pull in in front of him. As he watched, another pulled in behind him, wedging his vehicle in. Two men came out of the van and confronted Teddy. They angrily demanded to know if he was the man they had heard was muscling in on their territory, Thomas Campbell. Before he had the chance to reply, the real Thomas Campbell had exited a car which was tailing Rennock's van alongside his accomplices and had began to set about the men inquiring loudly at the van's serving window. One of the team, a young lad named Billy McPhee, took the keys for the Marchetti van and took it for a joyride as the men lay on the deck being beaten. The same tactics which the Marchettis had employed against the independent van men were now being employed against them with a strength and ferocity 
they could never have imagined. The police interviewed Rennick later that evening about the events, but ended up more puzzled than anything, pondering why, as a relative no-name with no real record, he seemed to be taking on the established firm. They were unaware that they had just conducted one of the first in-depth interviews with anyone involved in the turf war which was about to envelop the housing schemes of the east and north ends of Glasgow. The violence was escalating fast since the encounter between McGraw's crew and the Marchettis in Carntine and across the various housing schemes of Glasgow. With the initial hotbed in Carntine proving to the new firm on the block just how lucrative the business could be, similar sized runs in Easter House and Black Hill were becoming equally notorious for violence. Masked men would wield pickaxes, baseball bats, hammers, machetes and metal poles as they smashed up competitors' vehicles. Eventually, this escalated to shotguns fired through serving windows and cars driven into the side of parked vans. Eventually, some of the firms took to using all-women van crews, believing that the men involved were unlikely to hurt the fairer sex. Unfortunately for the women, money and the opportunity to make it overruled the more typical rules of engagement. For the most part, the men driving the vans were just that, drivers, but those at the highest levels pulling strings were dangerous to a level most of those behind the wheel simply could not fathom. One name kept popping up alongside Tam McGraw's as a man to watch. That name was Thomas T.C. Campbell. Ever since the early takeover of the Marchetti route in Carntine, he had been a focal point of McGraw's governance in the East End. Teddy Rennick alleged that he once stabbed a customer of their van as he stood waiting to be served as he had badmouthed Campbell in a pub and wished for the return of the Marchetti van. As always, the streets were stone-faced when the police came hunting for information, but off the record, people were talking and the police were listening. They were desperate to link him to anything, in their eyes to get a violent man off the streets. However, just as his name never appeared on his van with Teddy Rennock, it never appeared on anything that would stand up in court. The developing situation was at the forefront of the attention of the police. Almost nightly, they were called out to the housing schemes to deal with one complaint or another, all escalating in severity. A task force was set up by the Criminal Investigation Division, to deal with the situation. The media had given a name to the situation itself, dubbing the attacks the Ice Cream Wars. Despite the police's good intentions, the world of the ice cream van was too far cloaked in mystery and subtle threats to give them anything more than headaches, with a fair proportion of the local population having hostility toward the police, it made their job even harder. Given these factors, the policing of the violence was mostly ineffective. The lack of success from the serious crime squad dealing with the escalating violence led to their moniker of the serious chime squad. They were understandably unhappy at the slight and wanted some big players taken down to reset the balance and restore their reputation. The opportunity to do so was just around the corner. Word on the street had started to circulate that Thomas Campbell and Tam McGraw had a falling out over a likely secured van route 
that Bo fancied taking over. Campbell wasn't interested in just being McGraw's second in command. He wanted a chunk of it for himself as the undisputed main man. In the weeks that followed this dispute, McGraw was attacked outside his home, but the assailant was never identified. There was some intense speculation it may have been Campbell who carried out the attack. Nonetheless, McGraw recovered quickly and was still a familiar face at 50s, as was Campbell, and trade was roaring. Anything bubbling between the pair was well below the surface and below the radar of Glasgow's police service. Marchetti's, on the other hand, were fast running out of business as the 1980s dawned. 50 Ice's more competitive pricing and territorialism was putting vans out at a rate of knots and had quickly become the dominant force. By 1984, Marchetti could count the profitable runs which belonged exclusively to the firm on the one hand. One of the only lucrative runs they had left was where Garfamluk met Rokese and was serviced by the Mitchell family. Agnes Campbell, Thomas Campbell's sister, had started her independent van in the area with the goods purchased at McGraw's 50 Ices. There were allegations Campbell was supporting this van as this was the route which he and McGraw had allegedly had a dispute over. The Mitchells felt the strain and with their son Jimmy holding a senior role in the Marchetti firm, they arranged for a second van to work in the area. Its job was to get around the route ahead of Agnes Campbell, ensuring the two Marchetti vans would mop up the available business, drowning the competition out. There were allegations of the competition's vans being smashed up as it sat on the roadside, but that was nothing to do with the lad the Marchettis had recruited behind the wheel of the spare van on the route, Andrew Doyle. Doyle was a typical Rukese lad. He had grown up in the housing scheme, where he had gotten his nickname, Fat Boy, due to his large frame. Despite his undoubted strength and size, he was a gentle giant. He was the son of Lillian and James Doyle and lived with his entire family in a top floor tenement flat at 29 Bank End Street. Like most families in the estate at this time, there were far more people living in the flat than the number of bedrooms might suggest, but they all made a decent, honest living. Andrew's recruitment into the Marchetti firm had helped their financial predicament too. Like all Marchetti drivers, Andrew had heard rumours of the risks of working for the firm. Given that he was brought in as a blocker to the competition, he was aware this increased his risk of being targeted too. However, with the promises from the Marchetti firm that this little bit of assistance would net him a little cash just now and his own run in future, the thought of having a little jam today and a lot of jam tomorrow helped ease his nerves. In February of 1984, Andrew once again set off to help out the Mitchells in getting ahead of the independent van. He was working in the van with his 15-year-old serving assistant, Anne Wilson, planning his route. The pair usually worked 5.30pm to 11pm to achieve their run, which went from Porchester Street through Balvenny Street, Inverlochy Street, and then on to Tatters Hall Road, along with any arteries that ran alongside them. At 8pm, the van played its chime to alert the locals to the fact that it parked on Balvenny Street. Anne was seated in the front on top of a milk crate when she saw a maroon Volvo approaching. Andrew was in the back restoring some stock to its original shelf as it had fallen in transit. The approaching car slowed, then parked in front of the ice cream van. Anne felt no fear. It was likely just someone being dropped off. However, her mood soon changed. A man had emerged from the vehicle with a balaclava over his head and a shotgun in his hand. 
he walked up to the side of Andrew Doyle's vehicle, then round to the front and opened fire twice. Anne threw herself to the ground and scrambled into the back of the vehicle. The first shot created a hole the size of a soccer ball, then the second shot brought the window completely through. Andrew helped Anne escape the vehicle through a small hatch in the back, then with some degree of labour, due to his size, followed her through the same hole himself. The pair readied themselves to run, but as they exited the vehicle, the balaclava-wearing man returned to his vehicle and took off at high speed. A shaken Andrew asked a local nearby to phone the police. When they arrived, initial investigations were carried out and the attack was reported widely in local newspapers but little was ever found to corroborate the word on the street. The word, once again, was that Tam McGraw and Thomas Campbell wanted this route and any Marchetti driver on it had better prepare for war. Andrew kept working the route once his van had been patched up. He reset his stock, steeled his nerves against the memory of that night and returned to the streets of Garfamlick and Rakesi. On the 5th of April, a more direct warning came. No more was the attack on the van. As Andrew Doyle descended the stairs of his tenement building, he was assaulted by several hooded and masked men. The message was clear. Stop. Now. But he was made of tougher stuff than that. On the evening of April 15, 1984, the Doyle family had settled down to some dinner with two extra welcome guests. Alongside the usual cast of Lillian, James Sr., James Jr., Andrew, Stephen and Anthony, they welcomed back their sister Christina for a night over. She had brought her young son Mark, who had only recently turned 18 months old. They ate as a family, and when they finished, they all made space so that Christina and the baby could have the room nearest the front door. By 2am on April 16, 1984, the Doyle family were all asleep in their beds on the top floor of the Bank End Street tenement which they called home. As they slept, they were blissfully unaware of the men outside. They were unaware that shortly before they had amassed outside their flat, one of the men had asked a cashier at a local garage if he could buy petrol in a plastic canister, upon which she refused him service. When a more senior member of staff stepped in to say these men were to be served, despite her misgivings, she relented and processed their petrol. Men were then seen carrying large plastic canisters of fuel and emptying their contents in the landing outside of the Doyle family's flat and on the door of the flat itself. There was a small storage area too, in which the family stored spare tyres, paint and the like. That got a healthy dose of petrol too. When the group decided there was enough petrol on the ground to terrify the inhabitants, they walked partway down the stairs and flipped a lit match back up to the pulling fuel above. As the flames started to climb the door, they descended the stairs. The Doyles were taken entirely unaware. By the time they had awoken, the flames were engulfing much of their flat. Either whoever had made the calculations on what constituted a frightener amount of petrol had been wrong by a significant factor, or the message here was much more severe than a warning. The flames were made even thicker and more dangerous as they burnt the rubber on the tyres from the store. The Doyles made desperate attempts to escape as the acrid fumes filled every inch of their small flat. The way through their door was blocked off and opening the door to their balcony only made the flames grow higher. Being 40 feet up made it a difficult escape 
even from the balcony. Neighbours in the same building managed to escape through the stairwell quickly before the flames engulfed their part of the building too. Far more worryingly, they reported hearing screams, banging on walls and shouts for help ringing out for what seemed like hours. The screaming, banging and cries had continued long past the point which many would have expected the inhabitants to collapse as there was a solitary window in the flat which lay opposite the direction of the smoke. Members of the Doyle family, who had made it to the room with the lone safe window, were taking it in turns to breathe that small amount of life-saving oxygen, then swapping out when another member of the family was getting close to collapsing. In a situation whereby most people would have been out for themselves, the Doyle family stayed in it together. The fire department was on the scene as fast as their vehicles could take them. Police and ambulances were there too. Christina Halloran, James Doyle's eldest daughter, and her baby Mark were not able to make it into the safe room with the supply of oxygen. Christina was discovered cradling her body over that of her infant son, dying trying to protect him from the rising horror. Baby Mark was found barely breathing but despite the best efforts of the paramedics, died as a result of smoke inhalation at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. The remainder of the family had managed to survive the fire itself. Stephen Doyle had jumped from the balcony, braving the 40-foot drop and miraculously ended with only minor injuries. Lillian had been cut off from the rest of the family and was perched in another externally facing window until the fire brigade arrived. The remainder stayed by the remaining window, sucking in whatever air they could, and a whole lot of acrid smoke too. Members of the family, one by one, emerged from the devastation. Bare-chested, soot-covered and delirious, they were set off in ambulances attempting to reverse the effects of the smoke. As Andrew Doyle was led to a waiting ambulance, he shouted over to the waiting policeman, quote, You know who did this? Tragedy then became an onslaught for the family. Within 48 hours, James Doyle Sr. and Jr. had died as a result of smoke inhalation, as did Andrew and Anthony. Their lives were brutally cut short as a result of escalating violence that they had little, if any, part in. In ages, they ranged from 18 months old to 53 years. In death, their coffins filled the entire altar of their local church as they were buried by the only two members of the family who had survived the fire, Lillian and Stephen Doyle. In a rare media appearance in 1996, Lillian Doyle stated she was still plagued by nightmares of the screams from the fire at their Bank End Street flat. With the deaths becoming public news, attention focused immediately on the police investigation. The public was outraged and they wanted answers. They wanted arrests and they wanted them now and there were some potential suspects. At nearly 2am, a local man, Reg R, reported a vehicle driving in the opposite direction from Bank End Street at a dangerous speed. The car had crashed into a lamppost, after which the driver and its inhabitants fled. The inhabitants were described as three younger men and an older man. The police attended the scene and despite the vehicle having a strong smell of petrol and an empty petrol canister in the back seat, the police did not treat this crash as related to the fire. Charlie Craig, who led the investigation, didn't care about the descriptions of these men because they didn't fit his suspect. He was old school and used his nose for these kind of things. 
his on the ground informants from the area and his second in command, Nori Walker, had already told him something was brewing with Campbell in the area. His senses told him one thing about this case. This was, in Charlie Craig's eyes, Thomas Campbell and anyone who ran with him. Thomas Campbell was born in Kilcadens, Glasgow, on November 4, 1952, but moved to nearby Carntine at an early age. He was the youngest of ten children, although two died in infancy. His father was a tough man, known to berate the young Campbell about his belief that he was a tough guy, using his hands to teach the lessons he felt words could not. But Campbell more than believed he was a tough guy. Campbell was a tough guy. He stood tall and slender, with a nose almost flat into his face due to the occupational hazards of his fist's first approach. Campbell's fighting was self-described as being out of the Wild West, being equally skilled in combat with his fists or with a knife in his hand. His life wasn't easy. His father was in prison doing a 10 year sentence when his mother died and his sister Agnes was named his guardian along with his four similar aged siblings. By his mid-teens he had become the head of the Carntine Gaucho Razor Gang. While the name reflects their most common weaponry, the gang also made use of hammers and axes when battling other local gangs. A gang associate from his youth noted that if Thomas Campbell were heading up the charge of their gang, more like than not, the opposing young team, a term for Glasgow's youth gangs, would turn tail and run. Campbell himself was nearly always at the front of the charge. He had a long history of violence and was known for stabbing and slashing his victims. Every tough guy needs a tough woman to keep him right, and for Thomas Campbell, that was Liz. They had been together from young and stuck together, for better or worse. Another constant in Campbell's life was Tam McGraw. Campbell and McGraw had a tumultuous relationship. They were boss and hired heavy in some respects, business partners in others, friends and enemies as the wind took them. They had met when McGraw needed new faces to help rob post offices. McGraw's crew were the kings of this kind of raid. They were so successful in their venture, many of them had to hide underground for years as a result. The hundreds of thousands of cash they had in their pockets perhaps made this a less arduous task than it would be for many. After McGraw and Campbell met, they never unmet. They were two big players in a small circle of people who were skilled, unscrupulous and menacing, and their line of work brings even the closest of associates into dangerous territory. Joe Steele too was a local face. He had been born in Carntine, in Thomas Campbell's father's house in September of 1961. His parents were Andy and Margaret Steele. Despite being born in Carntine, he spent most of his early childhood in nearby Garfamlock, with a large family around him. The Steels were a well-known family in the area. They were not to be trifled with and had one another's back, no matter the opposition. This attitude and the deprivation common to many of Glasgow's schemes at the time had led Joe's brothers and father to stints in Peterhead prison. In the typical fashion of self-fulfilling prophecy, many members of his community remarked to him that he too would go to Peterhead like his brothers and father. They were not mistaken, however, their subtle influence cannot be wholly disregarded. Before he had hit full adolescence, 
Steele had begun working his way through the children's youth justice system. This led to a stint in St Andrew's approved school in Dunbartonshire, 50 miles away from his native east end of Glasgow, when he had just turned 14 years old. Rather than reform him, the institute merely bored him. One evening, as he and some childhood friends, Billy Love and Gary Moore, were looking for some mischief to get up to, they decided to break into the school. Having stolen some goods, they were chased by the authorities. Steele took refuge in a broken down building before being discovered by the St Andrews headmaster. The headmaster gave Joe a choice. Come back to the school and accept his fate, but avoid incarceration or be turned over to the police to face the justice system once more. Steele chose the court system and soon found himself one of the youngest boys in Scotland to be serving a custodial criminal sentence at only 15 years of age. One of the only consistent aspects in Joe's teenage and early adult life was his partner Dolly, whom he met at 14 and stayed with ever since. When he got out, when he wasn't spending time with Dolly or looking after his grandmother, known locally as Old Ma Padden, Steele took to working in the street sense of the word. By now, he was a stocky young man, well built with low slung shoulders, sporting his trademark see-through glasses and near balding despite his relative youth. Joe's father had done some work with the Crays in Scotland and south of the border. Joe was no different and in 1983 introduced himself to Thomas Campbell. Soon after this meeting, Steele found himself aligned with the McGraw crew in Glasgow and a familiar face around 50 Aces. Thomas Gray was less well known to the court system as an adult. Gray, known as Tambi the Bear, was a former gangland player in his youth and had been a member of Campbell's Gaucho Gang. He had spent a few years in Borstal for knife attacks as a youth but had renounced his involvement a number of years before the ice cream wars. He had in fact become a hairdresser and had not been in the dock for anything of note as a fully fledged adult. He had however been heavily involved with Campbell in his youth and remained a friend into adulthood. The stain of association was following Grey big time. In a similar vein were Thomas Lafferty Senior, known as Shadda, Glasgow slang for shadow, and his son Thomas Lafferty Junior, a scheme lad who was more involved with joyriding cars than any grand criminal enterprise. They were loyal to Campbell, as Shadda was married to Campbell's sister. The final member of their crew, Gary Moore, however, was fully involved in the gang culture from youth until the day of his arrest. Described by Thomas Campbell as hell on wheels, Moore was a car thief who would take a car, spin it for a few days, crash it and then sell it to a crusher for whatever value was left in it. He would do odd jobs for the higher ups too, violence mainly and stealing too. He was a face and no denying it. But one thing all these men would soon be denying was that they had anything to do with the fire at Bank End Street on April 16, 1984. Listening to true crime podcasts can be a great way to really get you thinking. But sometimes we all need a break. That's where puzzle game Best Fiends comes in. Skinwalker producer Matt Kay has found the perfect way to relax while editing our episodes is to take a quick break and level up through different puzzles and collect new fiends. Best Fiends keeps things fresh as you find new fiends 
and the levels get harder as you progress. They also add new levels and characters to play for monthly. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5 star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. As the investigations began, an associate of the 50 ICES crew, William Love, turned prosecution witness, there was a ground shift for the investigation. Love was held in Berlin on suspicion of an armed robbery unrelated to the ice cream wars. Looking to trade information for privilege, Love made mention of the fact that he knew some vital information that may be of interest to the police in the investigation of the fire at the house of the Doyle family. Love told a tale to the police of a campaign of violence against Andrew Doyle which he had assisted Thomas Campbell in exacting. When asked whether this meant the shooting in February, Love confirmed that he was the driver of the Volvo and Thomas Campbell was the man who had shot the gun. Afterwards, in the Barge pub, Campbell had thanked him for his assistance and promised he would see him right for helping out. More pressingly than that tale, Love told the investigating team that he had been in the Netherfield pub in late March when he had overheard a conversation at a nearby table where Thomas Campbell was sat alongside Joe Steele, Thomas Gray, Joseph Granger and Gary Moore in the weeks prior to the fire. The smoking gun they were looking for, he said, was the fact that Campbell had been discussing giving Andrew Doyle a further frightener by setting fire to the front door of his family's flat. Joe Steele was sitting in the group, repeatedly saying, aye aye, in agreement with the proposal. Having given the police a warrantable statement and with promises of further assistance should he be required, William Love was allowed out on bail. This was made all the stranger by the fact that at his initial hearing, there was significant objections due to the supposed danger that he posed to the public. A deal between the police, the prosecutors and William Love became heavily suspected. William Love's statement took on further gravity when Joseph Granger, a further associate of Campbell's, showed up to the police station in the aftermath to make a voluntary statement. Granger stated that he had been in a pub in which TC had proposed setting fire to the door of the Doyle's flat to warn off Fatboy from his route. He stated that he had then accompanied Campbell, Joe Steele and Gary Moore to case the flat prior to the act. Granger stated that he had went up to the door with Joe Steele and another man. They had told him to keep edgy a Scots term for acting the lookout, while they doused the door in petrol. After making this voluntary statement, Granger was allowed to walk free, despite having just admitted his role in a multiple murder. Joe Steele, Thomas Gray and Gary Moore were now no longer associates. They were in the frame for murder too. With the statements of Love and Granger, notarised and in their investigation file, the police moved that night, May 12, 1984, to secure Steele and Campbell into custody. Campbell was in bed with his wife Liz when the police arrived. Liz awoke, having heard car doors being banged outside of her house. She woke Tommy up and he headed downstairs to investigate the disturbance. As he opened the door, Campbell was met with the face of Detective Inspector William McCafferty and a warrant to search his house. Liz, Campbell and their toddler son Stephen 
were confined to the living room as the entire house was turned upside down, with Liz Campbell stating that even the Hoover bag was removed as evidence. TC was alleged to have stated, as he was cautioned by D.I. McCafferty, quote, I only wanted the Van Windies shot up. The fire at Fat Boys was only meant to be a frightener which went too far. A solitary piece of physical evidence was turned up too. On a sheet of paper which bore a join the dots game, Campbell and Liz had signed their names. On the other side was a photocopied map of the Rakesi housing scheme. On the map there was a mark a circle with crosshairs. The mark was left in the same house in Bank End Street where the fire had taken place. Joe Steele was similarly asleep in his grandmother's home when the police arrived to arrest him. He brooked no argument and went with the police to be questioned, protesting his innocence. The police delighted in telling him that a police informant had let them know in eerily similar circumstances to the evidence gathered against Thomas Campbell, that a certain Mr. Joe Steele had been overheard speaking about his involvement in the Doyle family fire in a local pub. Steele, upon hearing the officer's knowledge of the situation, became far less intractable in his denials of his involvement and he too made an incriminating statement against himself. Surrounded by four police officers, Steele was alleged to have stated, I'm no the one who lit the match. Similar raids delivered Gary Moore, Thomas Gray, Lafferty Jr. and Sr. to custody. Tam McGraw, the suspected leader of the 50 ISIS crew, was also arrested initially, but freed quickly thereafter, serving only two weeks in jail before being given bail, then being taken off the charge sheet altogether. McGraw was replaced in the frame by a local man named George Reed, who was to take McGraw's place as the mastermind of the violence. Initially, Campbell was charged with the fire-raising murder with his nephew, Thomas Lafferty Jr., as the others were investigated and charged for violence surrounding the fire, but not the fire itself. These initial hearings took place at the Sheriff Court in Glasgow, with the young Lafferty and Campbell firmly in the frame, and the focus of the investigation to that point had been to obtain evidence which proved Campbell and the young Lafferty had torched the house and to nail them for it. Armed with the new incriminating statements and the collection of testimony, the focus soon went away from Lafferty Jr. The young lad had been replaced in the frame by Joe Steele, Gary Moore and Thomas Gray. With two perfectly self-incriminating statements by two of the men firmly in the frame and several witnesses who had the perfect vantage point for Campbell and his associates' sloppy speeches in local pubs, with a little change of perspective, Solving the Doyle family murders was looking to be a home run. No longer would the CID's team on the ground be the serious chime squad. They were about to bust serious players and put them away for a severe stretch in prison. By the time the prosecution had decided their best rationale to explain the facts at hand, seven men were to appear at the High Court in Glasgow, charged with a variety of Ice Cream Wars incidents. These men were Thomas Campbell, Joe Steele, Thomas Gray, Thomas Lafferty Jr. and Sr., George Reed, and Gary Moore. Of these, only Campbell, Steele, Gray and Moore were facing the prospect of a conviction for the murder based on testimony to come. Key to proving their guilt was the statement of Joseph Granger. In a bizarre twist, Granger took the stand, 
not to corroborate the voluntary statement he had given to the police, but instead to state that the entire encounter was made up by the police and he had been coerced to sign. Granger stated he was not a party to any conversation in a pub and did not incriminate anyone intentionally, but had signed an invented statement written by the police. One of his statements bore particular weight when he stated, quote, I swear, I had fuck all to do with that fire. Granger's recanted statement cost him five years of liberty for perjury. Granger's removal from the evidence pool did little to deter the prosecution's fervour. They simply shifted the lens from the now retracted statement of Granger to the testimony of William Love and his sharp eared remembrance of the encounter in the pub. William Love expanded his story to note he was within a degree of certainty that the meeting had either taken place on either Friday or Saturday, which would have been March 23 or March 24 of 1984, when Love stated that he had received Campbell's gratitude for driving him to the shooting up of Andrew Doyle's van, Campbell countered that it was Love who had shot the van and he was simply using Campbell as a front to distance himself from the crime. The prosecution continued undeterred. As Love's testimony unfolded and Campbell and Steele's alleged statements to the arresting officers were presented, the landscape did not look promising for two of the main players in the dock. The men themselves were adamant the entire thing was a stitch up. Next to speak were the police officers who had come to give their statements about the arrests of Joe Steele and Thomas Campbell. Every officer gave an almost identical statement. Little varied in their grammar, their recollection of seemingly trivial events and absolutely nothing differed in their memory of the incriminating statements that both men had made. Strangely, they consistently used the same spelling of words such as no rather than not, imitating the men's Glasgow brogues. Joe Bultrami noted with some heavy implication that he found such consistency to be interesting. When the presenting of evidence was complete, the judge presiding, Lord Ken Craig, noted the lack of physical evidence linking anyone, never mind the men in the dock, to the fire itself. Everything was based on verbals, supported only by the credibility of the person delivering it. In that sense, it was accepted that there was insufficient evidence to convict the men should the testimony of William Love not be accepted by the jury. With the limits of William Love's testimony in mind, tied to the lack of directly incriminating evidence or statements from the men themselves, Gary Moore and Thomas Gray were released from the charges of murder against the Doyle family. Thomas Lafferty Sr and Jr too had theirs removed earlier within proceedings, although other Ice Cream Wars offences on many of their charge sheets did remain to be heard by the jury. Lord Ken Craig then shifted the focus for the murders firmly back onto the two remaining men, Thomas Campbell and Joe Steele, on the murder charges. Lord Ken Craig made specific mention that the remaining men had made statements about their own guilt. Further to that, William Love would have had to snare many of the most suspicious investigators in society within a lie should he not be telling the truth. The implication was clear. Love's testimony held weight in the eyes of the judge. Then, he returned to addressing the statements the police alleged Campbell and Steele to have made. Lord Ken Craig noted that should they have been false, then the jury would have to accept that not one or two or four, but a large number of detectives have deliberately come here to perjure themselves to build up a false case against an accused person. It would further mean there had been a conspiracy 
by officers of the most sinister and serious kind to saddle the accused wrongly with the crimes of murder and attempted murder and murder of a horrendous nature. It was clear on which side of the fence the judge fell. However, the fate of Thomas Campbell and Joe Steele lay in the hands of a jury of their peers. After two days, the jury returned. They sided with the investigating and prosecuting forces and handed down a verdict of guilty against both parties on all charges. Thomas Campbell received a life sentence with a minimum tariff of 20 years. Joe Steele was given a life sentence with no minimum tariff. Throughout their incarceration, both men maintained their innocence. Together, they presented a united front as the Glasgow Two, wrongfully imprisoned for six murders which they had not committed. Joe Steele repeatedly enacted non-violent and audacious escapes from prison to spread the message of his proclaimed innocence. He had first escaped from Perth jail in 1989, then sought in prison in the early 90s, before famously escaping again and tying himself to the fence at Buckingham Palace in April of 1993. Campbell and Steele had also made a pact that throughout their imprisonment they would never cooperate with the police to prove they would sooner serve hard time, to prove they were fitted up, rather than cut a deal which diminished this proposition. After several years of hard time, Campbell agreed on a move to Berlini Prison's special unit, a much comfier place to serve a sentence and a deal with the authorities. This move created significant and long-lasting tension between the two. Although publicly they were the Glasgow Two, they were enemies behind closed doors. Campbell had also begun to suspect whilst inside that Tam McGraw, a supposed friend of the pair, was discouraging people from looking too deeply into the crimes. Why he would want to prevent their release was unknown, although upon this discovery, Campbell firmly switched the lens of his suspicion for the fit up onto his one-time friend and business associate. In 1989, Campbell was unlawfully attacked by prison guards and was awarded £4,000 in compensation for his injuries. John Linton was a believer in the pair's innocence and was himself a known street player. He had turned away from his tax-free occupation to support his friends in their fight against their conviction. Believing them entirely, that they were victims of a severe miscarriage of justice. Famed Scots true crime author Reg Mackay declared John a saint turned sinner. People outside of the criminal fraternity began to have doubts too. Some people didn't think the story which the jury had convicted on added up. One such man was a local Glasgow city councillor and future member of the Scottish Parliament, Tommy Sheridan. Sheridan was a socialist with a strong focus on justice. When Sheridan spoke with Linton, he became a convert to the alleged plight of the Glasgow Two. The two organised marches and rallies to have their appeal heard, alleging police corruption and wrongful conviction, allowing the real guilty parties to remain at liberty. For Linton, taking such a visible stand for his friends had an added element of danger. Linton was, at the time, living in the same neighbourhood as the man many on the streets were pointing to as the true mastermind behind the crime, Tam McGraw. Men like McGraw did not take lightly to such public accusations against them and also didn't like anyone poking their nose into his business. 
This did little to deter Linton, who by the mid-1990s had an entire campaign office focused on releasing leaflets and letters in the name of Campbell and Steele and his Free the Glasgow 2 campaign. Upon leaving his East End offices, he was assaulted multiple times in the parking lot by those who opposed his message. Linton also received a letter to say the building in which his office was rented had been bought over. As he read through the letter, it stated that he was expected to leave the premises. The campaign itself was at a particularly important juncture as Thomas Campbell was on hunger strike and had begun to have severe health implications. While Campbell was transported to Law Hospital in Curluck for treatment, Linton was stuck packing up his office. It later transpired that the new owner of the office block was an associate of Tam McGraw and other than Linton's office, the remaining tenants had been allowed to continue their occupation. It was, in Linton's eyes, an attack against the campaign. In April of 1996, things came to a head between the pair. In an altercation in the Sheeling Bar in Shettleston, which was home turf for McGraw, Linton rolled insults at McGraw and McGraw at Linton. The two came to blows before Linton left the pub hurriedly. Despite there being no immediate ramifications, between the campaign and the direct attacks, Linton was playing with fire. When Linton attended the Roadhouse pub in Easterhouse for a meeting, he had little reason to suspect a plot at work. Easterhouse wasn't home turf for him, but it was something close to. He knew many of the families from the area and was well liked by many drinkers in the pub. When he arrived at the pub, he was surrounded and shot mafia style by a group of men. Each man fired a bullet so that none would testify against another there later. Some street players were claiming that it was drug related, but most of the gossip on the street alleged that John Linton had flown too close to the sun and paid the price. Despite both allegations, the streets were quiet from those willing to testify. Unsurprisingly, nobody was ever charged or convicted with the murder of John Linton. Linton's murder provoked Campbell to end his hunger strike in hospital, as in his words, with John gone, he would have to prove his own innocence. As the years passed and the impact of Thomas Sheridan and John Linton's campaign began to take root, the public themselves became unconvinced by the justice in the Glasgow Two's convictions. The pair's antics while they were imprisoned may have put off some, but injustice resonates with everyone. There were multiple public allegations from local street players hitting the papers, that around the time of the Campbell and Steele arrests, they had been threatened with association with the crime if they didn't sign comprehensive statements pointing to Campbell and Steele as the guilty parties. Others alleged police violence to the same end. Others alleged reductions in sentences and charges disappearing if they would issue an incriminating statement against Campbell. With these in mind, Granger's statement, which led him to a conviction for perjury, began to look far less improbable. Furthermore, both Reg R and the lady in the petrol station nearby to the Doyle family's flat both came forward to state that they had made themselves available to the police as witnesses. However, when they did not identify Campbell and Steele as the men involved, they were never contacted again. A further blow was struck to the convictions when the testimony of William Love was overruled as he had admitted to fabricating evidence. 
Love's testimony had corroborated the position of another police informer who testified that he had overheard the pair admitting responsibility for the fire and was pivotal in the prosecution's case against Campbell and Steele. Frank Falloon, another East End local, was being held on remand with William Love. He spoke publicly of Love having approached him in Berlini to tell him that the police had offered him freedom for the testimony to put Steele and Campbell behind bars. Despite Falloon's advice to stay away from the deal, Love, it seemed, had accepted the offer. When Love had stated that he had overheard Thomas Campbell's admission of guilt, he was being held, as noted, pending trial for his suspected role in an armed robbery. It was not unusual for Berlini's remand inhabitants to bargain with police over their knowledge of other crimes not associated with their own hands in exchange for either favourable sentencing or having the objections to their bail removed. There was one key complication, however. The armed robbery for which William Love had been arrested had taken place on the same weekend he had stated he overheard Thomas Campbell make the damning admission. This, in and of itself, meant nothing. However, while Love defended himself from the accusations against him, he had given an all-encompassing alibi for his whereabouts on the weekend of the crime. Love listed many locations where he could have been spotted by eagle-eyed passers-by that weekend to prove his innocence. One place which did not feature on his list was the Netherfield pub, in which he stated he had overheard the damning admission for which he testified in court. It transpired that Love had given a further contradictory version of events, which was buried within the investigation documents. In this version, he had been in the pub on the weekend of March 23rd, however the admissions of guilt had not taken place until some time in early to mid-April. How William Love supposedly heard this information while being on remand in Berlin prison was anyone's guess. It likely contributed to why this specific version of events, one of three in total given by William Love, was hidden underneath a mountain of paperwork in the investigator's files and not made available at pre-trial to the defence team. Should it have been made available, Thomas Campbell and Joe Steele may never have been convicted of the Doyle family's murders. Proof of William Love's deceit was not to end there. Agnes Carleton, in 2000, had stated to a Channel 4 documentary that it was her brother who had shot up the Marchetti van in which Andrew Doyle had been working in February of 1984. Thomas Campbell had been accused of that in Love's testimony too. Her brother had then brought the weapon into their home in a black bin liner prior to its disposal. Her brother was William Love. In the filming of the same documentary, Love, who was then living between Dartmoor and London, admitted to having fabricated his testimony and admitted he had shot up the Marchetti van as his sister had confessed. When pressed on whether he had acted under the instructions of Thomas Campbell, Love stated he had acted under instruction, but those instructions had not come from Thomas Campbell. When asked who had given the instruction, Love refused to be drawn on the issue. Many speculated in the aftermath that he feared saying the name of Tam McGraw for fear of reprisal attacks. The arrests and convictions against Joe Steele and Thomas Campbell came further into dispute when analysis was given to Joseph Granger's statement. Exact details of this statement were not made public at the time due to the recanting of his evidence at trial. But in 2000, Trial and Error, a Channel 4 production, got a hold of Joseph Granger's original statement. In it, he noted that he had kept edgy 
a week after the discussions in the Netherfield pub, which had taken place around the 9th of April. This contrasted with William Love's allegation that the plot had taken place in March. Had Love and Granger both testified, the defence may have seen the impossibility of the dates. Should Scott's law at the time have enforced full pre-trial disclosure, it was almost certain to have been picked up on. Unfortunately, in 1984, disclosure was given on the rationale of the Crown Prosecutor and formed little more than a gentleman's agreement that the main facts would be shared. What this meant in practice was that while Campbell and Steele were convicted on the basis of William Love's accusation of an overheard conversation in a pub in March, Joseph Granger was tried and eventually found guilty of perjury in relation to the same incident for recanting supposedly true testimony that he was privy to the same conversation in mid-April. The two statements ran in conflict. They could not both be true. Either Granger had perjured himself in an attempt to save Thomas Campbell and Joe Steele, or William Love had committed perjury to save his own skin at the expense of two innocent men's lives. In 1996, Scots law was brought into line with English law, with a retrospective review on convictions being allowed when testimony was no longer considered valid or sound. With Granger and Love's version of events now both seen as unreliable, Steele and Campbell were ordered to be immediately released pending review. Despite this, just over a year later, the pair's convictions were reaffirmed by two of the three appeal judges and they were returned to custody. In 2002, the pair were granted further right of appeal and were returned to the outside world, awaiting the legal case to proceed. Evidence from psychologists cast doubt on testimony given by police officers concerning incriminating statements said to have been made by both defendants. Four officers reported Campbell as saying, I only wanted the van windows shot up. The fire at Fat Boys was only meant to be a frightener which went too far. The officers recollections of what was said, known as verbals, were nearly identical. But the psychologists brought forth evidence from a study they had conducted, which had four groups listen to tape short sentences, then try and recall their content after various durations. The results of the study showed the groups did not remember even such short sentences word for word. In fact, in 24 word statements, the majority remembered that most 40% of the content. The likelihood of multiple officers remembering 24 word statements independently and after the fact was almost nil. Given the evidence of Granger and Love was no longer available or admissible for a prosecution, the overturning of the legal weight behind the police statements dealt a damaging blow to Campbell and Steele's convictions. Specifically, the appeal court judges decided that the jury would have viewed the police's evidence in a quote, different light, had they known such similarity was almost impossible and the convictions were unsafe on that basis. Campbell and Steele, after the false dawn in 1996, were finally cleared of association with the murder of the Doyle family in 2004. After 20 years in prison, Campbell and Steele were finally released as free men. While undoubtedly a massive win for justice, albeit 20 years too late, the outcome had the unfortunate after effect of returning the remaining members of the Doyle family to square one with no one found guilty of their murder, and little wish from the police to change that fact. It was not all smiles for the Glasgow two either. The pair's relationship had deteriorated, seemingly beyond repair. Speaking to the national press, Steele stated that he could barely look at Campbell, 
as he had been quote, up to his neck in ice cream wars and his association with the man had ruined his life. He went on to question whether if Campbell had spoken the truth at the time, the men who had truly committed the crime would have been jailed, rather than the Glasgow Two. Tam the licensee McGraw is under the most suspicion, not for being the man who lit the house, but for being the man who ordered it. According to Joe Steele, not only does he know that McGraw ordered the torching of their house, he knows who lit the flame. Thomas Campbell claimed that he had information from a source which he provided to the police that Tam McGraw had been spotted buying a canister of petrol on the day of the fires. An interesting event took place after the interim release of Campbell in late April of 2002. Tam McGraw was attacked in broad daylight, only surviving as a result of the bulletproof vest he wore whenever he went outside. A week later, two men attacked Campbell with knives and golf clubs to his serious injury in a vicious fight. The men who committed the attack were McGraw and a since murdered henchman called Billy McPhee. Either it was revenge for the week previous or they wanted Thomas Campbell silenced. Casting the eye further back to the evening before the fire, a further incident of note had allegedly taken place involving Tam McGraw. Tam McGraw's brother-in-law had recently renovated an ice cream van to take up against the Marchetti's in Rukese, with the independent making way for his move into the area. Having been on the run for a while since the last independent moved out, they were aware of the young Doyle. The McGraw van, nicknamed the Rukese Boxers, exited on the one car wide street out of Rukese. Andrew Doyle, and his old clapped out Marchetti van was coming in at the same junction. Doyle's face lit up with laughter as he flashed the pair inside his high beam headlights and drove straight at them. The narrowness of the road and wishing to protect their high spec van gave the Rikese boxers van no choice but to pull to the side and slam on the brakes. Two gangsters in a state of the art ice cream truck had just been, in their eyes, turned over by a daft young boy from the estate having too much fun in an old truck. Could this event have been the final straw for McGraw? Already angered by the young Doyle lad's persistence in keeping his route, had a single act of youthful daring do caused McGraw to order the fire? We may never know, as Tam the licensee McGraw passed away of a heart attack in 2007, and all that remains is rumour and whispers. There are few other plausible suspects for being the mastermind, but no matter which way it is spun, Tam McGraw was far too senior to have been the man on the landing. If he was the authority behind the order, who was the man who lit the match? Thomas Campbell is confident that two local drug addicts were recruited by Tam McGraw on the evening of the fire to perform a frightener in return for money to pay for a fix. Campbell alleged evidence that it was Tam McGraw in the back of the vehicle when one of the drug addicts made inquiries about getting petrol in a plastic canister in the petrol station nearby to Bank N Street. McGraw's face in the vehicle was the reason why the manager of the petrol station had swayed his young cashier around to processing the man's request, rather than allowing her to refuse him service. The morning after the events, Campbell continued, the drug addicts were visited by an enforcer who quietly let them know that they had never actually been in the company of Mr McGraw last night and had received no word from him on what to do. If they were not okay with this version of events and their actions, 
they could assist them there by silencing them forever. The message was received and these two men went to ground, their actions never punished in a court of law. One other suspect is Gary Moore. Moore was one of those in the dock in 1984, before being freed of the charge by the judge due to lack of evidence. He had not taken this as a second chance and instead had doubled down to become a gangland enforcer. He notably served an eight year sentence for the murder of a notorious Scots gangster's son in 1994. He was also a suspect in a slew of other gangland hits, attacks and the killing of a sex worker. A month before Moore died in 2010, he is alleged to have admitted to having been the one who torched the Doyle flat. Moore was quoted as having said, It was me that did them. All six of them. I torched them. Do I regret it? Not one bit. When questioned by a newspaper about the admission, Joe Steele stated, Gary's no angel, but he never admitted to anyone he'd done the Doyle family. He never admitted to fuck all in his life. Moore's partner, Anne, stated that he admitted many things in his past, but had always vehemently protested to her that he did not light the fire at the Doyle family's flat. Anne further alleged that Moore had made the statement to cover for his biological cousin, Gordon Ness, who had lit the match in April of 1984. Ness, who was a far smaller player in the criminal circles and was an associate of Joe Steele with a criminal history and housebreaking, died in 2012, having made no statement on the matter. Joe Steele was only 42 when he was released, having been in prison since he was in his late teens and spent much of his youth in youth institutions. He spent eight years in solitary confinement, up to two years at a time for a crime which he never committed. Steele had become addicted to drugs during his time in prison, mainly due to the stigma of being branded a child murderer, but has since gotten himself clean since his release. He mostly avoids the limelight, having made his point at the gates of Buckingham Palace and upon his release. One notable exception was his appearance on James English Anything Goes podcast, whereby he spoke openly and honestly about the criminal life he left behind. Steele has avoided any further run-ins with the police and remains a free man to this day. He relates to his experiences but distances himself from them too. He stated he holds no animosity towards the current police, as the ones who fitted him up are now dead, and those who backed up the lies told at trial by their superiors had been disgraced in the eyes of the public. He did, however, remark that there was likely more cases like his from the period, as certain corrupt officers of the time had, quote, fitted more people up than Jackson's the tailors. Thomas Campbell, on the other hand, struggled after his release. Having spent so many years behind bars, he bore the physical scars of his incarceration. Campbell had gone on hunger strike several times to attempt to add significance to the release effort. These prolonged periods without food and water seriously jeopardised his long-term health and well-being. Campbell renounced the violence of his youth and wrote extensively, including a novel with Reg Mackay outlining his experiences in life and the justice system. He too appeared on James English Anything Goes podcast, whereby he spoke eloquently and at length about his life and experiences. Having not been seen or heard from for weeks, Campbell was found dead at his remote home outside the noon in June of 2019 by his ex-wife Karen, after he had failed to respond to a Father's Day message from their daughter Shannon. Prior to Campbell's death, 
he and Steele had recently reconciled, with the peace terms being brokered by a friend of both men. The police have never conducted an inquiry into the lies which were told at trial and currently are not actively pursuing any lines of inquiry into the case. The Bank End Street flats which were at the centre of the Doyle family murders were demolished by the council and are now waste ground, awaiting promised regeneration in the area. Despite Campbell and Steele's criminal past and their association with a less savoury aspect of society, they too were robbed of much of their life on the evening the Doyle family's home was torched and six innocents lost their life. Whatever their crimes had been in the past and their involvement in the ice cream wars more generally, nobody should spend a moment imprisoned for a crime which they did not commit. The culture of street violence, aggression, territorialism and a police unit which focused on getting players off the streets rather than seeking justice for the victims met in a way which ensured that many lives were wrecked that day. When considering the Doyle family, it is hard to end this in a way that does their suffering justice. The Doyle family suffered immensely then, as they did again when it turned out the police had done an insufficient job in bringing their family's killer to justice and instead focused on removing one of their own problems from the street. A quote from Joe Steele, when interviewed by James English on his Anything Goes show in 2019, starkly outlines the problematic position in which the case remains. Quote, I believe the Doyle family deserve the truth, but I doubt they will ever get it now. The police have had many years to set the record straight, so you have to ask why they never did. 